This video is sponsored by MassDrop. By shopping at MassDrop, you can get a variety of quality products including the AKG K7XX headphones. The K7XX is the most popular headphone available on MassDrop with almost 20,000 purchases. With an inch of memory phone as ear cups, what I like most about it is the extremely comfortable design as it makes hours upon hours of editing a breeze. This video was actually made using these headphones, so check them out with the link in the description box below. You got all that? Cool. You know, as great as Breath of the Wild is, the logic behind how everything works is just hilarious. Take the paraglider for example. Not only can you glide with something that in reality wouldn't actually work, but you can do stuff like this. Yeah, you saw that right. He just casually went from high speeds to a halt within less than a second without any consequences. In reality, his arms would have probably been ripped clean off of his body. Come on Nintendo, where are those extra details? On the other hand, I guess that wouldn't work for a game that is rated E for everyone. E for excruciating pain? I guess that could work. You know, at this point I've done my fair share of Breath of the Wild theories. And for being the 21st video, I'm only just now going to be incorporating something I've wanted to include in my videos for the longest time. Math. More specifically though, physics. I loved all of my physics classes in high school, and it's kind of sad that it took all the way until now to be using it. So we'll be taking a break from looking at the dark nature of malice or the fabled tetraforce theory and answer a simple question. Well, a few actually. Think of this as a compilation of mini-theories. We'll do a few things such as figure out how tall all of the towers are in the game, and even find out the acceleration of gravity for Hyrule. Gee, it sure is boring around here. But the biggest question I will answer is this. Would Link survive the Ridgeland Tower Jump? While it may sound like an impossible thing to do, thanks to certain tools in-game along with real-world equations, we should be able to get a definitive answer. Also before I forget, shout out to Evan A. Wolf on my Discord server since he gave me the idea for this video. So before we drop from towers, we need to figure out a few things. First off, we need to find the equations that we can use to solve for the other unknown variables. In this case, we will be using the Big Five Kinematic Equations for Motion. The BFKE are used in real-world problems and can help solve for displacement, initial and final velocity of an object, time or acceleration. So for example, if I threw a ball straight up in the air and knew its initial velocity, the time it took to reach the highest point, and the acceleration of gravity, I could plug that into one of the equations and find out how high it went. So these equations are very accurate, and what one you use will depend on the information you are given. But now we need to figure out how to find said information in the game. Time is going to be easy since we could vertically drop from anywhere in the game and run it through a video editing software. But that's all we really know. Well, as funny as it might sound, there is an accurate way of measuring all this. And the answer is three words. Bird. Man. Research. At the Ridgeland Tower, there is an NPC that will let you play the paragliding game where you try to fly as far away from the tower as possible. The reason this is so important is because the distance traveled is measured in M. In real life, meters are also M. So we can assume that the distance is being measured by the same unit in the game. Now with a proper unit of measurement, we can use this to our advantage and get the data that we need. To start, I did five different drop tests from the tower and recorded the distance traveled for all of them. After doing so, I calculated the average drop distance, which was approximately 62.98 meters, or to simplify it, 63 meters tall. Of course, this doesn't count the part of the tower in the water, but we already have what we need to find the acceleration of gravity. To do this, we will use a method to find something called the instantaneous velocity for two different parts of the fall. This value will help us because we can determine how fast Link is falling at any specific time we want. I decided to find it at 0.667 seconds to 7.01 and 2.102 seconds to 1.35. All we need to do now is plug these values into a simple equation to get the initial and final velocities. Our VI value ends up being 21.2 meters per second, while the final velocity right before Link lands in the water is 60.6 meters per second. Now by having both the velocity values and the time it takes, we will be able to solve for the acceleration of Breath of the Wild's world. According to the calculations, gravity has a downward acceleration of 27.5 meters per second squared. Wait, what? 27.5? Wow, that is a, a lot of force being put on Link. For comparison, Earth's gravity is only 9.8 meters per second squared, so Hyrule's gravity is nearly triple the strength of the Earth's. I guess you could call it the Triforce of the Earth's gravity. No? 
Okay. Now I wanted to make sure that this answer was right, so I went back and tried a different method by solving for a final velocity and used an initial velocity of zero. Zero being right before Link drops down and the final velocity as his final speed before hitting the water. I got 59.0 meters per second and used that to solve for my gravity, giving me an acceleration of 27.6 meters per second squared. That's pretty close to our other method, so we can safely assume that this is the correct value for gravity. So what does this all mean? Well, first of all, assuming that Link has the mass of an average male over 20 in the US, then would he survive this drop? The average weight of a male is 195.7 pounds. But to find the force exerted on him, we need the mass, which happens to be the same equation. F equals mg. M is mass, and g is the acceleration of gravity. First, we'll need to use Earth's gravity to find a regular person's mass. Then use that with the new gravity value. I'll be converting pounds to kilograms so these numbers aren't too high. Running through the equation for force, the mass comes out to be 9.07 kilograms. This means that Link's weight would be 249.3 kilograms. But we won't need this value, since all that matters is the mass. Remember when I calculated the final velocity right before hitting the ground when we were trying to solve for acceleration? Well, now we have to find a new acceleration value. The moment that Link hits the ground and goes from a 60.6 meters per second to a velocity of zero. We'll say that it takes 0.05 seconds for this change in velocity, since it would happen very fast. You might think that the time it would take to decelerate would be much higher because we are landing in water, but because it is nearly incompressible and the player is traveling at high speeds, it would be no different than Link landing on concrete. Going back to our acceleration equation, plugging in the time of impact and velocity values, we get an acceleration of... wow. 1,212 meters per second squared. If we plug that back into our force equation along with Link's estimated mass, it would amount to around 11,000 newtons of force. That certainly is a lot of force, since only 4,000 newtons is needed to break your femur bone. The problem though is that there are a lot more factors that are required to know if this would be deadly or not. Information like the type of bone and area of impact are important. The problem with this equation, however, is our time of deceleration. As said before, it is true that impacting water can be as hard as concrete, but one of the biggest factors in determining this is Link's form when he makes the jump. Belly flopping is a big no-no when it comes to impacting the water. When you jump into a body of water, your body will push the water to the side to make room for your mass. But when you land, it only has a small amount of time to do this. Belly flopping increases the surface area of impact, therefore there is more water water that needs to be displaced. Even small jumps can cause pain to the person since the force they experience upon impact is much greater. Luckily, Link does not enter the water this way, so the chances of him surviving this are much greater. But with that said, let's actually look at the way he enters the water. Link dives head first, which is a very common method of entry. This reduces the amount of splash in the water and the arms are straightforward to help disperse the water for the rest of his mass. But would this prevent him from being killed upon impact? Well, something you might not know is that the head first dive is not the safest method to enter a body of water. And that's because, well, you are going in head first. Even if you have your arms out, your head will be taking a lot of the impact force when landing in the water, since it is one of the first parts of your body to reach the surface. So now the question is, at what height does this type of diving get dangerous? After doing some research, I found out that professional divers won't land headfirst into water from a height of 65 feet or more. This is to prevent any injuries. 65 feet is approximately 19.8 meters, but because Hyrule has a different gravity, we must compare the final velocity of both a real-life diver's jump and Link's in order to see if he would survive. After doing calculations with Earth's gravity, the velocity before impacting the water of a normal diver is 19.7 meters per second. In reality, this would be slightly more, since they wouldn't have an initial velocity of zero. Now since we know Hyrule's acceleration of gravity, we can record the time it takes for Link to complete a dive and use that in our equation. I'll first calculate the initial velocity with the following equation, which after solving, shows us that Link jumps into the water at an upward velocity of 11.6 meters per second. Since we are dealing with velocities in two different directions, up and down, we need to make our initial velocity positive and our final velocity and displacement negative. Plugging all of this in gives us Link's final velocity for his dive, which is 60 meters per second. And yeah, that should probably speak for itself. Link is hitting the water at triple the recommended speed. It's pretty safe to say that he probably wouldn't survive this, as the force would be too much for his little noggin to handle. But let's just say that he landed in the water using the safest method. Feet first. The whole idea is that you let your not-so-critical parts of the body hit the water first. And because your head would hit the water last, it would give you the most time to accelerate as well as disperse the water under you to ensure a safe landing. Well, almost safe, as in at least it won't kill you. Back in 2015, 
27-year-old Lasso Schaller broke the cliff diving record when he fell 193 feet into the water, around 58.8 meters. Even with his experience, he exited the water with a slightly dislocated hip. If Link's 60.6 meters per second is higher than the world record's velocity, we can pretty much bust this theory. After plugging all the information in, we can finally get our answer. Ladies and gentlemen, the fastest you can enter a body of water until it is lethal is... 33.9 meters per second. In other words, Link would not survive this drop. 33.9 meters per second is almost half of the speed Link reaches before impacting the water. And as said before, even the most experienced cliff divers are at risk of injury. In 1987, Oliver Favre dropped a total of 177 feet into the water, but because he dove in backwards, he couldn't see his trajectory when he originally left the platform. He survived the jump, but had sustained a broken back. If professional divers with years of experience still get injured, there is no way that Link would survive this. Maybe next time he might reconsider jumping from Shatterback Point. So with that big question finally answered, it's time to address the Sheikah Towers. How tall are these things? I won't be counting the top of the tower since that is a bit of a tricky one to solve. Surprisingly, a lot of them are the exact same size. When dropping from the towers, I found out that around 10 of them have the exact same fall time as the Ridgeland Tower. This means that most of the towers are around 58 to 63 meters. That leaves five others. Ridgeland, Gerudo, Wasteland, Dueling Peaks, and Woodland. These towers are going to be a bit more of an issue, four of them being submerged in water and mud while the Grudo Tower extends all the way into the abyss. But luckily, we have a way to figure out exactly how big these ones are. Because we know that the Ridgeland Tower is around 63 meters, we can use one of Link's most useful abilities to find the information needed his climbing. Because Link climbs at a constant velocity, I started at the bottom of the tower and scaled it to the top measuring how long it took. The climb took a total of 1 minute 46 seconds, or to be more specific, 106 seconds. Doing simple math using the tower's height, we get a velocity of 0.59 meters per second. I then traveled to the Wasteland Tower and stacked a bunch of giant metal crates on top of each other. I timed how long it took to climb exactly three of them which clocked in at around 17.184 seconds. By using our velocity value, that meant that the total height of the three crates was 10.14 meters. Dividing by three will then give us the length of a single crate. 3.38 meters to be exact. So now we have a proper scale to work with. For good measure though, I wanted to find out exactly how tall our protagonist was. By lining him up with one of the crates and using a ruler to measure out his size, I found out that he was 0.4375 the length of a crate. And multiplying that value to a crate length means that we will finally have a height for our silent hero. The official height of Link in Breath of the Wild is 1.48 meters. Converting that to feet we get, wow, 4.9 feet. That's actually kind of on the short side. Oh well, now we know I guess. Anyways, with that done, let's get back to our Sheikah Tower dilemma. As you know, some of these towers are submerged, and unfortunately, it's hard to know exactly how far down they go. But thanks to our knowledge of the crate size, all we have to do now is stack them and see how far they reach. First of all, it took one full crate and around 40% of the other one to reach the surface of the Wasteland Tower. This means that the tower is an extra 4.7 meters, ranging from a height of 62 to 67 meters. I tried bringing these crates to the other towers, but that didn't really go so well. So I then found the size of the smaller metal crates, being around half the size of the big ones, or 1.69 meters. Luckily, there was an enemy camp with metal crates close to the Dueling Peaks Tower, and upon placing them in the water, it took exactly two small ones to reach the water level. That's an extra 3.38 meters to the structure, giving us an overall height of around 61 to 66 meters. Since there were no crates to use around the Ridgeline Tower, I estimated that it would take around three big crates, meaning that overall the tower was 68 to 73 meters. That leaves two final towers, Woodland and Gerudo. These are more complicated because, while the others could be easily calculated with the big five equations, there is something preventing me from doing that same method. Terminal Velocity This is the highest attainable velocity that a free-falling object can reach. It happens when the sum of drag force equals the force of gravity. While there was an equation for it, there was too much stuff I didn't know. So I did the next best thing. I used the Birdman research and analyzed every single frame to try and guess when it took effect and how fast the terminal velocity was. From what I could guess, 
Terminal velocity is reached at around 2.15 seconds and is around 60 meters per second. This means that for the first 2.15 seconds of fall, we will need to use the kinematic equations to determine distance and then use a simple V equals D over T for the rest of the time it takes. First, we'll do the Woodland Tower. As strange as it sounds, the length of this one that extends out of the mud is greater than the others. It takes 2.436 seconds to land, and after plugging into our equation, gives us 63.6 meters for the first 2.15 seconds and 17.2 meters for the rest of the fall. But we still aren't done. We need to find the depth of the mud by using our useful crate tools. It takes one big crate and a half of a smaller one, giving us our third answer of 4.2 meters. When we add that all up, we find out that the Woodland Tower is a total of 85 meters tall. And now, we save the best for last. The biggest of all of them, the Gerudo Tower. Unfortunately, we cannot find the exact size of it, but the least we can do is calculate the minimum height that it needs to be. To do that, I will time the drop all the way until I can no longer see Link, and then we will have our final answer. The total drop time took around 7.574 seconds, so time to do the calculations one more time. We don't have to solve for the distance since we already got that from the Woodland Tower. That first 2.15 seconds will once again be 63.6 meters. But with that last 5.424 seconds at terminal velocity, it will give us a whopping 325.4 meters. Meaning that the height of the tallest tower in Breath of the Wild is... 389 meters. And that is the minimum height it can be. Who knows how far down it goes. So there you have it. We've done many things today ranging from proving Link's Ridgeland Dive is lethal all the way to the exact size of the Sheikah Towers. I don't really have much to say in closing for this video, but I'd just like to say that I really enjoyed making this one. Physics is something that I am very passionate about, and I'm glad that so many of you guys enjoy it. And hey, if I got anything wrong in here, then feel free to let me know in the comments. If you would like to see more math-related theories, then let me know. And as usual, subscribe if you want to see more.